I don't want people to get left behind with this technology. And in that brief little snippet, you had Dan Grushkin, a co-founder of Genspace and director of Biodesign Challenge. In this episode, we get into his favorite books, how to try your path forward, why he founded Genspace, how did he make the transition from being a journalist to a founder of a DIY biotech space, and why he keeps doing it, what he wants to keep pushing for. Tune in every Tuesday to the Learning with Lowell podcast with me, your host, Lowell, to hear world-class scientists, startup founders, CEOs, and authors, people who you wouldn't normally hear about but are making huge waves all the same. You'll understand them and their work by hearing their passion, laughter, advice, and hearing them, the experts, break down what they're working on so that you can learn, push the boundaries of your knowledge, and understanding. Three quick ways to show your support and get unique, exclusive, and fun content is by checking out the learningwithlowell.com website, our Patreon page, even if it's just a buck, it keeps this advertisement free and subscribing how did asking difficult questions as a journalist help you in what you're doing today i think one of the wonderful things about being a journalist is that you get to ask questions and you can as you know you can ask kind of any question that uh, you want you have you have a free license to be curious about other people and it's not it's not strange for you to ask those questions. I think there's something really wonderful about that. It allows you to be uh, curious about other people in, in a way where, you know, social norms about being that inquisitive might seem strange. You know, when you're, when, when you report on things, when you report on people, you, it's just free reign to really delve deep into what it is they're excited about. I think at a certain point, asking those questions are what led me to science. It wasn't, ever clear in my in my in my growing up or you know uh when i was thinking about what i would do with my career it was never clear that you know i would be in the sciences at all and i think it's largely born of 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 having been a journalist have you ever asked a question that got you in trouble probably can i think of an example off the bat probably not (laughs) yeah i think uh trying to think you know, so a long time ago, I, I wrote an article about a company called Amaris, um, which is, was one of the early synthetic biology companies. And I remember there was a point where my subject uh, was let go from his job as CTO of the company. This is while I was reporting in the story. And I called him for comment about that to see if it were true. Um, and this actually, this whole dialogue ended up in the article. And it wasn't exactly clear whether he had known. And it was a very awkward interaction. But I think that was probably one of the weirdest, uh, weirdest moments for me. You know, there were other points where, you know, I was calling people for other articles when I was doing crime stories around the world of biotech, where I was calling people when they were, who were in prison. Um, and those were always really kind of fraught dialogues. So, yeah. I guess it's, it's part of the job. I, I imagine the prison people are, are easy to get on the phone in the sense that like they're probably really bored and just happy to talk to someone. No, not exactly. <laughs> I, I usually, usually there's some letter writing. Um, you know, they, they don't generally have access to phones. So what ends up happening is uh, you, you reach out to loved ones and they, they pass on the message. It's actually, it's not quite, it's not easy at all. Hmm. Yeah, I, I would have thought, Easy in the in the sense that like they're not going anywhere. Like the the FBI in like the seventies, they made a TV show on this, and a, there was a book about it called My Hunter, where they basically just went around and they started interviewing the criminals because it's like oh they're there, good research subject, and so they, right. they learned a lot from that. But oh that's interesting. I I wouldn't. Yeah, well not everyone is you know not everyone's happy to tell their stories, so um it can it can be a challenge as a journalist to to hear. To get people to tell you their version of what had happened and how they ended up in in prison in the first place. Hmm. Sure, that is a bit of a, a tough bandaid to rip off. It, it, as a as a as someone who's been a journalist, with mm-hmm. like all the because it's personally it's really hard to know where to get good news with like a lot of bias in there. So I'm just curious, like, how do you examine when you like if you read the paper? If you read the paper or anything like that, how do you examine and like suss out like what's valid and what's not? Like, 
Because I think that's really, really difficult nowadays. Sure. I think, I think no one can know everything about any, any subject. I think you have to really delve into all the different perspectives and, you know, read the reports that are being put out on the subject, getting social, getting historical context, getting some of the larger context, even before I think you're able to really talk intelligently on the subject. And I think that takes a lot of time and a lot of research. So, you know, just perusing a news article, that's, you know, certainly a way in, but I don't think it necessarily will give you the full a uh, complicated story um, of what's being reported on. Usually it's sort of the, the latest twist in the story um, that gets covered in a, in a straight news story. Does that answer your question? I'm not sure. I mean, it, it talked about the complexities of it and how no one can <clears throat> really know everything. But at the same time, it's like the, the concern I have is like, I think, there was a study that came out recently, and I've, I've talked to a number of people my age where they just kind of like read the title. They don't read the content, which is sometimes like not really related to the title. And so I, I always mm-hmm. wonder, like, how can you, with, with a limited budget of time, you know, like time is very finite, how can you be knowledgeable, like stay current of events without being bogged down by misinformation? Because like, I feel like anytime you read an article, you're basically investing that time into reading that which then you have to figure out, you have to spend time sussing out whether or not it's a valid article. Like, is it, are the sources and what it says accurate in any way? And it's just like, there's a great time commitment in figuring that out. So I'm just wondering, is there any like good rules of thumb for doing that? So I and other people can save our time. Sure, there are some, some basic ones. I certainly am not the expert on, on, on that. I, I, Talk to someone else on that subject. Honestly, I think, you know, you need to read whatever you're reading with a healthy set of skepticism and, and with the understanding that uh, there's more to the story that's, that's in a, you know, a 300 or 400 word article. That's fair. And, sir, and, and to be fair, you know, if you're just reading the headline, I don't, I, often the, the, uh, the writer with the byline isn't the person who, also, who writes the headline. Often that's someone else in a, in a different department where the editor writes the headline. And so the messaging on the headline might be very different from what you read in the article. And people should be aware of that, too. That's interesting. I, I, I always noted a disconnect between the two, but I didn't know. that. I, I would think the guy who or the lady who wrote the article would have say on what the title is because they would know what it's about. But yeah, sometimes, sometimes not. Oh, that's interesting. Learn something new. All right, then. Mm-hmm. Uh, kind of transitioning to more of what you're doing nowadays, there's a, a book by Peter Thiel called Zero to One, and it's basically like how to create something when there wasn't something before. And so you, mm. you, you kind of did that for yourself in creating like a, like a DIY type movement around yourself. So I'm just curious, like how did, how did that evolve? DIY bio existed, pre-existed even my knowledge of it. So, you know, I was a reporter when I first learned about it and was interested to learn more as a reporter. I only got sucked in after that fact. So in the early days of the DIY movement, most of the people who were doing it were either hosting meetup groups and local bars. And I'm thinking specifically of Mackenzie Cowell and Jason Bobe, who had a, a meetup that was going on uh, in Cambridge, I'm thinking about a handful of people who had little almost closet labs in their homes. Either they were working in their basement or they had a little setup in their in their apartment somewhere. So there, you know, there were people who were working on this er- in, earlier than I got involved. I got involved because essentially, you know, I was reading this message board called DIY Bio, um, which still exists today. And I was watching all of this, people sort of talking about, well, what what is DIY bio? We want to work on biology projects. We don't know how or where yet. Where do we get tools? Who else is out there that I might be able to collaborate with? So, um, you know, I was involved with a group of people who were talking about it in New York City. And uh, in our first meeting, we met at a, like a burger place in, in Mintad, Manhattan somewhere. Uh, and it was a PhD scientist, it was two undergraduates, it was me, later an artist joined the group, um, and then another PhD biologist, and so there was a little collective of us that started to meet, 
Um, what became almost immediately clear was there was nowhere to actually do the work. And so, you know, when we ran the, went around the table and folks started to talk about, well, where are we going to meet next or where are we going to do an experiment? You know, um, the PhD scientists lived in uh, lived in in upstate New York, and the undergraduates lived in dorms, and it didn't make sense for them. Um, I happened to have a living room in my apartment in uh, Park Slope, uh, and so I ended up inviting everyone to my house, and that's sort of how the New York chapter of DIY Bio was born. And eventually, GenSpace um, emerged out of that. Uh, within a year of just meeting in my apartment and talking about what we wanted to do and trying some really basic experiments, um, it became clear that we needed a dedicated space to really build off of what could be done uh, in just a living room. You know, what would happen would be that people would come uh, over to my house for three hours. We would do something like a protein purification or maybe a very basic um, bacterial transformation from kits that we bought online from um, Carolina or, you know, basically kits that were, were designed for parents who were doing homeschooling or for small classrooms. Um, and at the end of each session, you know, we take everything that we did and we basically bleach it and throw it out. And so you would never be able to continue experiments uh, over any real period of time. It became, and, and that was for obvious reasons, you know, there's only so much you can do in a living room. I had roommates, we, they were, no one's going to be happy with having, you know, bacterial samples just hanging around the house. So um, literally within a couple of months, we started to search for a space to, to dedicate to doing this kind of hobbyist research. Um, and it took a full year to find gen, the, the original gen space. Um, but when we moved in, uh, we, we built out a lab, and the hope was that people from, you know, basically from out there in New York would see that this was built and they would start to show up and join our community. But at the time, we had no real knowing, no real knowledge whether that would work. And happily, it did. And, and GenSpace has grown significantly since it's almost been 10 years now. Has there been anything that came from that that surprised you? Or were did it kind of go in an iterative way and you're like, okay, this is what's going to happen next, this is going to happen next. And maybe the scale of it was surprising, but was there anything like specific that was like kind of like that Arthur C. Clarke quote, the most interesting things that happen aren't are eureka in a lab, but that's interesting. So I always wonder, like, was there anything that you said, well, that's interesting. I didn't think it would happen like that or something would happen with, in that way. I mean, all of it was a complete surprise to me. You know, it was a surprise to me when we ran around the table and folks said, well, we can't meet in my apartment. We can't meet in my apartment. It was a surprise to me when I said, well, why don't we meet in my apartment? That was a shock. Uh, it was a shock when, uh, we moved, we, we found, we finally found the space. Uh, it was a really interesting seven story building full of artists and designers. And, um, the owner of the building had, where there weren't people working, he had filled it with all this, I don't know what to call it, basically um, furniture and uh, building supplies from basically buildings that had been torn down. So just imagine just lumber and random dusty chairs and you name it. It was like we were working in a warehouse. That was a total surprise and, and, a, and, a, and a good one because it, it gave us the basically – gave us the space to try something very new and also the rent was cheap enough where you know we could figure it out so that was a surprise it was a surprise when we came up with the term the community biology lab and people seemed to like that it was a, it was a surprise when other labs started to follow um follow the model right after we started so i think the second lab to open was biocurious they opened nine months later um, and now, you know, according to, I think, Brookings, the Brookings Institute, there's roughly 169 other groups out in the world that are doing something similar to us. So uh, all of it was a surprise. And, you know, and the creativity that people brought to, uh, brought to the lab has been a surprise. The classes that we've taught, the 
types of people who have shown up in terms of their their backgrounds and their professions. I don't think I don't think a thing like that could have been planned. Has anyone come and taken a course and like gone on to develop things at like an iGEM competition or something like that? So Genspace has participated in iGEM um, multiple years since 2011. We won Best Measurement Award in 2000, I believe 2015 or 16. So, you know, we were a mix of high school, local high school students and passionate adults. Um, that was fantastic. We had a group that from the 2014 iGEM competition that decided they were going to make a liquid handling robot for the lab. Uh, a low-cost version that became a company called OpenTrons. OpenTrons has uh, easily 50 plus employees now. Uh, they're in multiple cities around the world, and they're shipping robots literally everywhere. Um, that emerged out of uh, basically an iGen project that started in GenSpace uh, with very very humble means. So from from its founding, uh, what has been your role or the key things that you've done to kind of help make surprising things like that happen? I would, I, you know, I don't, I don't want, I can't claim any credit for these things happening. I think that the beauty of GenSpace is that we've, we've created a platform for people who are interested in biotechnology to explore. And by virtue of their passion and their, I, I guess their, their, their commitment to their projects, you know, amazing things happen. Uh, because there's that springboard for them. Yeah. You know, when I, before there was a gem space, but, you know, there was no place outside of academia or, or a company where someone could come in and basically ex explore and learn about DNA sciences in the hands-on way. So if you wanted to work, you know, learn how to do PCR, for example, um, or insert a genetic modification into a bacteria, there would be no place for you to do that. Um, and I think just by virtue of our existence, lots of exciting things have come out of it. I, th I think that's one piece of it. And I think the other piece of it is we do a lot of education work. So, you know, once we built the space, the question that we asked ourselves was, well, what are we going to do in the space? Who are the people that are here? What are their, what, how do they want to use the space? And so some of the people were had a real science bent, uh, bend, and they wanted to, um, you know, explore and do some basic research. Others um, wanted to start companies. Others were hobbyists and wanted to explore something about the natural world using DNA sciences. And then there were artists and designers showing up who were bringing their expertise um, and their uh, ways of thinking to the subject as well. So. You know, what did we bring to it? I think we bring ourselves to it. And I think the people who show up at the lab also bring themselves to it. And, and, and really, the, the joy of GenSpace is that people who would otherwise not have met each other, who are live in maybe different parts of the city or different, have different walks of life, uh, are collaborating. Um, and I think really wonderful things come out of that. I meant you specifically, not like GenSpace as a... As a, good to know like how they contribute, but I was curious like how you contribute. So uh, right now, uh, so I'm the executive director of GenSpace. So my job is to basically make sure that operations are running, uh, that the spaces that you know that we're basically serving our community, um, that our programming is good and solid, um, and that we have the funding that we need to keep going. So I've been doing this for. A little while, and it is often a challenge, but I think a, a, a really fulfilling job, just because of the creativity that comes out of the space and and the learning that comes out of that space. You know, in the early early days, I was uh, obviously a co-founder and a board member, um, and really involved in trying to figure out well, what what is this thing, right? Because when we started. There was, no, there was no such thing as a community biology lab. The closest thing that we had as a model was the hacker space. Uh, and the hacker space being a place where people share uh, 3D printers and laser cutting equipment and lathes and all kinds of uh, hardware of that nature. But none of that is um, similar 
or uh, a lot of that is very, quite different from what you might see in a, in a biotech lab. And the equipment in the biotech lab is very different. And obviously the thing that you're working on, which is usually a living thing, is very different from an electronics project. And as such, it's quite different from a hackerspace. But we didn't know that. All we knew is that, well, it seems like hackerspaces are figuring out how to do this. Maybe we could sort of be the equivalent just with biology. Um, and I think there are some parallels for sure. And I think there are lots of ways in which we diverge. Um, so I think a lot of, you know, my job and I think the early board members job was to really suss out what this organization was about and what its purpose was and what, how it was going to fit into the fabric of New York City and obviously how it was going to fit, fit into this fabric of people who were interested in, in bringing biotechnology beyond the walls of academia and industry. Um, you know, there was an entire, there were lots of big questions about biosecurity and biosafety that were coming from the policy world that we had to deal with. You know, a big portion of what we were thinking, what, what we had to deal with in those early days was, was thinking about, well, what are our neighbors going to think about us? Um, you know, what happens if our neighbors call the police and say, hey, there's some funny stuff going on in this this uh, this warehouse next to my apartment? Um, oh, what do you say to our first responders? Um, you know, there was a lot of mixed, um, I would say, there was a real mix of uh, perspectives coming out of the media on what um, this burgeoning DIY bio movement was. And I think at least for the first five years, I was, uh, as part of just figuring out what we were about, we were also working to allay people's fears about this as a movement. Um, and I think, you know, part of the success of those first five years was I think we, we demonstrated that we are far more than a resource to our community, far more of a resource really to the world than um, anything that would be threatening. Has anything, that, that, was, that was a lot of work. Yeah, I can imagine. But has anything, have you seen anyone like accidentally do something threatening? Like maybe they were like working on B and like something like weird came out of it and they were like, you know, burn it with a fire, you know. <laughs> yeah, what, like like aliens or something? No, yeah. no, nothing. Not even close. Not yeah, even. No xenomorphs. No. no, sorry. No. I wish you know it's 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 not like TV at all. That's good. I mean, the, the <laughs> scientists are pretty incompetent. Like the they have advanced technology and they decide to try and tame a, an alien. Like that's that's what they want to do. Like that doesn't. Nope. Nope. Never happened. You know, yeah. the, the honest truth is that when when your experiments fail, most of the time it means that your organism does not survive the, the transformation. Mm -hmm. And when we talk about your organism, we're usually talking about uh, a, a dish of, of bacteria. Yeah. Is there you know, very very early on in the in the formation of GenSpace, we decided that we were going to be what's called biosafety level one. Biosafety level one means that. Uh, you do not work with anything that is remote, could possibly be pathogenic to a human. Um, so, you know, we're no more dangerous maybe than a high school biology classroom. Is there anything that you want to see be researched and, and, and done that you'd want to lead? Is there like any like questions, like your journalist I mean, brain is like, oh, yeah. You know, the question I ask myself a lot is not about, you know, what kind of science should be done in these spaces. Uh, the, the, the question that I ask a lot is how do we sustain these spaces? How do we make more of these spaces exist in the world? How do we have, let's say, a neighborhood lab in every neighborhood across the country? And what would that look like and how would that change people's relationship with science? So really, I'm thinking about it as a, as a cultural phenomenon. I'm thinking about it as how do we weave what we do as a community biology lab into the fabric of, of our civil life, as our, our lives as, as, as people in this country and people of this world. So right, how do we weave science into our daily lives is really what I'm asking. 
um, in a hands-on exploratory way. I think it's one thing to read about what other people are doing. Um, I think that's really exciting. Uh, it's a whole nother level when you try it for yourself. And so one of the things that we really promote at GenSpace and actually require from our instructors is that everything has to be hands-on. Once you learn the concepts, you need to get into the lab and actually see them at work and in the lab setting. Uh, that's That's been really, really important to us and to me personally. So yeah, so if you're asking, you know, what kind of science do I want to see? I want, you know, the science to be responsible. I want it to be safe. But I want it to be happening, and I want it to be happening in a, uh, in a sort of a, a, a massive uh, democratic way a, a, across neighborhoods. That, that's how I'd, that's what I would like to see. We had we had something similar to that called Victory Gardens in World War II, where they did agricultural stuff in every in every community. So I, I really miss those. I mean, not that I lived through them, but I really wish we still had stuff like that. Where, so tell me, am I right? Victory Gardens were like a response to World War II and the fact that um, a, a lot of our farmers were at war. Am I? Do I have that? Rationing, right? essentially, yeah, rationing more than anything. Like we scarce resources, so like everyone kind of had to push right. in, you know, donate paper and whatnot. But yeah, essentially. Got it. I mean, uh, you know, I don't. I see the. <laughs> I would want to compare this to a wartime scenario. I think what we're talking about is that. You know, the fact that biotechnology is a really transformational technology. Um, re, as, as it develops, I think that we as a society are going to have to make uh, important decisions about how it should and should not be used. Um, I would like to see, you know, our citizenship and, and voters really informed about the technology in, in a deeper way. Um, and I think it starts really with the hands-on, and I think it starts really with basically community engagement and neighborhoods. Um, and so I think that, you know, in the future, as these communities grow and more of them more and more and more show up in the world, uh, I think that they'll have an influence on how people think about science, and that, that's really important to me. It's like... A the analogy I always give is like raising the tides, it raises all the ships. Like the more science mm -hmm. literate we can be as a people, the generally the better off it is. Like people who are educated seem to be less likely to commit crime and a number of other nice benefits. So I mean there's the other there's another factory which is a uh, factor which is that, you know, um, when you look at the the economic numbers, biotechnology as a technology is becoming more and more a part of our economy. Uh, more and more part of our daily lives, you know, spaces like ours could be a, a real bridge for people who would ordinarily not have access and be a bridge for those people to really enter into the bioeconomy and be the drivers of the bioeconomy. And I think that's really important too. Um, I don't want people to get left behind with this technology. I, I, I think that would be a, a mistake on two fronts. I think it would be a mistake because you know, they'd be left out of the, the, the you know, the plenty that might, um, the economic plenty that might come out of this um, growth of this technology. And I think on another hand, on the, on the other hand, you know, they might get left behind in the decision making about how the technology gets used. Um, so I think there are lots of reasons why more of us should be engaged in biology and biotechnology. Mm -hmm. And lots of reasons why there should be things like Gen Space and BioCurious, Bugs in Baltimore, uh, and Denver Bio in Denver, uh, because uh, they're really engaging new populations or populations that would ordinarily not have access to this technology uh, in the technology to have deeper discussions and really be that bridge. So, you know, I think people are doing a lot of good work in this community, and I think they should be celebrated. Um, I'd make a joke about being slightly biased since you're a part of it, but I also agree with what your mission, so I won't, I won't uh, joke with you. But, um, for, for people who want to kind of specialize, like, how does what you're doing compared to, like, a traditional, like, PhD program or anything like that? Would it, is it, would you get, like, the technical skills, but not the theoretical knowledge, or, like, how does it, like, compare out? 
Um, so the way that it usually, so I, I think it's a little bit, the model is a little bit reversed. Usually when you go into uh, an academic setting, you're starting from the basics. So you're saying, well, I'm going to learn about biology and then later I'm going to come up with some experiments um, to learn about biology. Usually when people come to gen space, it's exactly the reverse. They have a, a project that they want to pursue, but don't quite know how to do it. So what can often happen is that people use that drive and that passion to then backfill all the knowledge that they need to pursue that, that project. Um, I would say that's one major difference. Um, I would also say that, you know, these are two communities or, or two in types of institutions that are absolutely not in opposition. They, they're really ideally partnered. So, you know, if you're going and you're going to pursue your PhD and you're going to do your seven years of education and you're going to work uh, under a, a, a principal investigator in your research and you're going to do write peer review papers like that, that's wonderful. That feeds right into our community because, hey, you know, if you're doing this work at a university near our lab, you know, we're another venue for you to then share your knowledge with a larger, broader community. Or conversely, you know, if we have members of our of our community that are working on a project and need someone who has that expertise, like there's someone for them to reach out to. Um, so, in some ways, I wouldn't I wouldn't think of them in opposition to each other. I would think of them as part of the same ecosystem. Um, a lot of our members are post are, are, are PhD scientists who are now going back into the lab and, and trying something new. Um, a lot of our members are, you know, have the, the skill sets, but they want to explore something that they wouldn't have been able to explore because they didn't have access to a, to a lab for that to sort of um, exploration. So in some ways, I think there's kind of a, a really nice feedback feedback loop between these communities. Um, so I, I would say this, you know, if you're interested in getting your hands wet, really just learning about the science, but not necessarily dedicating your life to it, you know, we have classes that are, are literally built just for you. You know, it's, you know, they're three hour sessions. They're a couple of times, um, throughout the, throughout the month. And you can really feel like, oh, I have a grasp of, of what this technology is about. I've got into the lab. I've tried some basic, um, uh, basic uh, science techniques. Um, and then there are those who are hobbyists who have a day job and want to do this as their fun. Um, and then there are those who really have committed to this um, as researchers. Uh, maybe, you know, being in, acad in an academic setting makes more sense for them. Maybe it doesn't, you know, really to each their own. Um, but I, I do feel really strongly like these two types of organizations feed each other in really wonderful ways. So I think, you, you know, if you were saying, well, do I want to go and get a PhD or go to um, work at a gen space or a community biology lab, I think the answer would be, well, why not both? <laughs> you know, why not do some exploration at the community biology lab, but also pursue a PhD if that's what if that's where your passion lies. Um, or if you feel like, you know, I, I want to explore this and I want to spend time on it, um, but I don't want to go through the the, the rigor and the, the time that it takes to be in a PhD program. We're talking about seven years of, of your life. Uh, at least, um, you know, there are these spaces for you to explore the natural world and explore biology and science that don't require that level of commitment. So Matt, do you play D&D &D by chance? I'm going to try, I'm going to try to draw an analogy if you know, know D&D. &D. Uh, I don't play it, but I know it. Uh, my brother plays D&D. &D. Okay. So I don't even know if this is D&D, &D, but it's like similar to D&D &D, where there's like these, I will... It's like from the Dresden Files. It's like a fate system. It's kind of like D and D. Uh, maybe I'm gonna fail at my own analogy, but the, um, like a PhD person is like a full-on wizard, where like someone from your program would be like a focused practitioner that are like a like instead of being able to 
wield a variety of things. They kind of like specialize as like a pyromancer or something like that, and, and, and which takes less time, but is more niche on what they actually want to learn. And as you said, it kind of like backfill from there as like a comparable analogy to what the. the I mean, are you are you are you saying that some people are specialists and some people are generalists, or I? Yeah, I'm, that's, I'm that's losing, probably I'm losing yeah. on the analogy. <laughs> yeah, that's basically it. <laughs> it's kind of like. I mean, I, all scientists end up becoming specialists in a specific field. So I, you know, it's like a comparatively, one is a generalist and having a wider breadth of knowledge on a subject. Where I, I, I suspect that people from your programs are more narrow on what their interests lie in, and then like backfilling to understand that, which. So, like, comparatively to the two, like, one is more of a generalist or one is more of a specialist in that way. That's okay. Yeah. <laughs> I, think that, I think that, you know, each case is, is really individual. And what we find are there are some people who come to our space and they really, they want to dabble in everything. We have, we have a number of people who do that. Um, and that's wonderful. And then we have some people who have a really specific project that they just want to work on. Um, both, are, both are obviously welcome. Um, and I think in academia, usually there's a sort of a push for, 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 um, graduate students to really focus on a very specific, um, area of research. It kind of sounds a little bit like an accelerator where they give you basic lab space and then like kind of push in like a startup world. So is there any component where like if someone develops like a company or something with using what you guys do that you guys get? like a part of it as helping them accelerate it? Or is it just like the platform of being able to have the lab space and the knowledge? So, you know, this is actually something that we argued over in the early, early days of GenSpace, which was, you know, what happens if there's some brilliant breakthrough that happens in our space? Do we um, ask for intellectual property um, from, from the work that happened in the space? And um, there was a pretty unanimous agreement that, we would not ask for any intellectual property um, from the work that happened in our space, which I think um, is there are pros and cons to that approach. Um, but yeah, so uh, let me answer in the short and say, no, we, we ask for no ownership of, of the work that happens in our space. Um, and I think that's wonderful for the people who are innovating in our space. Um, and I think, you know, makes them more comfortable to do their work out in the open, um, which is really important to us. This concept of transparency is really important to us. But yeah, no, we're, I think in some ways that that accelerator model is it's an interesting one, and certainly we've been we've fed young entrepreneurs into that model. Gen space is really a hybrid space. You know, we are doing education for. Uh, high school students and public high schools. We are doing education for adult learners, again, hands on in the lab. We have members who are everything from hobbyists and artists and designers uh, to uh, entrepreneurs. So um, it's really a, a, a mixed community. The, the closest I would say that the model I would compare it to might be a community center where you have lots of people who have lots of different reasons for being there, but they're all in that same space. If someone were to come to you and be like, I developed something in the lab, and I'd love to partner with you guys and give you a percentage and then work together to make it great. Would you, has anyone ever done that? Or, or what would you do if someone <laughs> ever did that? I mean, we have people coming and saying, hey, I have a, I have a company that I'm trying to get off the ground um, and I need space to work in. That happens all the time. And so actually we have a tiered membership model for GenSpace. So if, if you want to, you know, basically launch your company out of our space, um, we give you a desk space and we give you a corporate rate for being at GenSpace. And then we support you with our staff as best as we can. You know, I, yeah, that, that's, that's the way that, that we usually proceed with that. So a number of, we have a number of seats available for, for companies uh, in our space. And the wonderful thing, I think, is that, you know, you get to be a company with heart because, yes, you're focusing on your product and building your business. But at the same time, you could recruit some of our high schoolers to be your interns. Uh, you can re recruit some of our adults to be your interns. Um, you can contribute to other people's projects. 
you know, you're integrated into a community where everyone is trying to learn and develop projects and ideas. So, you know, in some ways, I think that's probably really wonderful for, for an entrepreneur um, because they're just basically um, fit right into a community that is really actively engaged in, in, in biotechnology in general. And they have a lot of opportunity to work with other people who are there simply because they want to help and be involved. So that's nothing like an accelerator. <laughs> but, but at the same time, you know, we we are seeing companies emerge out of GenSpace and doing quite well. Is there any any of them that are like that you're particularly proud of? So Open Trans is a good one. Mm. Um, I love to bring them up. Um, they showed up. It was a uh, and an, a design graduate student at NYU ITP, and he had partnered with uh, an engineer, and they were going to, their plan was to make a very inexpensive lab robot. So basically a robot that would do your pipetting for you. Um, these are can cost in the tens of thousands of dollars um, when you're talking about these, when you're talking about sophisticated um, lab robots, and they wanted to make one uh, on the order of, you know, a couple thousand dollars and they succeeded. And now they are an, an enormous, I mean, enormous by our standards, an enormous company. They have, they have 60, 50 or 60 plus employees and they're, they have an office in China. They have an office in New York. Um, and, uh, they are shipping robots all over the world at this point. And it's largely because they, these two people showed up and met, uh, at GenSpace and, served to elaborate and then took an idea to the next level. Um, but none of that would have happened had there not been a gen space. So for, you've done this for 10, 10 years. What's like, mm -hmm. if you could look 10 years in the future and have any world based on what you're, what you can build and contribute to it, what would you like it to be? And what do you think you would need to do over the next 10 years to see it happen? Or that you want to do or are planning to do over the next 10 years to see it happen? Um, that's a good question. Um, I think, I think I would like to see more stakeholders involved in the development of biotechnology. So I don't, I don't think that biologists or scientists, uh, could really develop this technology into applications that could be transformative and useful and, and, and healthy for society without having other stakeholders involved in the development of those technologies. And so really what I'd like to see is not necessarily, I don't want to see, you know, I don't, I'm not, I, I don't want to talk about any particular application because I really think that this is a, a, a question that we as a society need to explore, but I would like to see more people in our society engaged in the questions of both what do we want to build with biotechnology? Um, what are some of the promises and what are some of the pitfalls? Um, where should we go with it? And where do we think, you know what, this is not a great application. Let's not, let's not go in that direction. Um, I would like to see labs like ours dotting, you know, the world, certainly neighborhoods around the United States. Um, in the very least, uh, and, and see them as a place where folks from all types of backgrounds are, want to go to, to explore the natural world in, uh, in a deeper way, right? So here we have this facility where you can literally extract the DNA from any organism and explore it on the level of the nucleotide. Um, and that is a, a, an enormous tool, an enormous lens, or, or an enormously powerful lens through which to look at the living world. And I think, you know, that has the, the power to awe us and inspire us and make us appreciate the, the, the living world around us. And I think that gives us an enormous power to harness that living world. Uh, for human betterment. I think, you know, these are also great spaces to ask the question of what is human betterment? And I would like to see much more people thinking about, well, 
well, how does biotechnology fit into uh, into that future world? So I don't have, you know, I'm not talking about flying cars or anything of that nature. I'm talking about a, a, a civil society really deeply engaged in this question of what do we want from our technologies? And I think spaces like GenSpace are, are a good example. I think finding ways to bring people with different um, skill sets and other backgrounds into the conversation is really important. And you know, I, I just I should shout out the Biodesign Challenge, which is a program that's really about that um, uh, as, as being integ integral to this sort of future 10 or 15 years into, you know, from now. Does that yeah, begin no, it, to answer your question? Yeah, yeah. No, it's, it's especially, you know, off the cuff, it's really hard to answer a question like that that kind of like gives you that existential dread of what am I, what am I going to do? But I always think it's good to, I had a debate recently with, with someone who was telling, was arguing whether or not it was good to have a plan, even if your interests change over the years. And it's like, if you don't have a plan, then you're just going to choose whatever kind of is easier, is the most pleasurable. And then like, you can't make those like, sacrifices for like this long-term gain so it's like some of those things i always think about and it's very hard to answer but i think you answered it well um, well what do you think i mean is it good to have a plan or is it better to sort of um sort of find what pleases you i think you should look at where you want what do you want to be like what like how you like it's very like of course it's a very deeply personal question like what is successful to you and i think you, mm -hmm. you need to decide like what that is like is it having a PhD, being, and even a PhD in of itself just represents some type of store knowledge or like some type of knowledge set that makes you feel like you can do something. So I think it's, it's good to have a plan. Like how do you get to that level as effectively as possible? So you're not just like constantly wandering in the weeds, but at the same time, mm -hmm. you shouldn't be totally removed from the day-to-day -day life to the point where you're only like, you're sacrificing today. Like you should, you should be, kind of like balancing the two, like doing some stuff today that's kind of fun, but still in that realm, but then keeping your eyes open to other opportunities, other perspectives that can make you see things that you didn't even know exist. I think that's the 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 argument for being short-term and being a little bit more fluid is that there's so many other things out there that, you, that could potentially exist that if you lock into one, you might miss them. And that's why I always think it's, it's good to listen with both your ears to what everything that's around you, like listen to as many people as possible, but still remain focused on what your interests are and that that, that long term plan, so that you're at least developing in a purposeful way, so that you can mm -hmm. make the most out of your life. That would be my answer. Uh, do you agree or disagree? <laughs> um, I can only tell you what I've done. I don't think if I had a fully fully formed plan early on in my life that I would have ever ended up doing the things that I do now. That's not to say that having a plan is a bad thing. I think I've been someone who's sort of been more searching and through that search of, has landed in some very, I think to me at least, very interesting, among some very interesting people and in, in some interesting places. And, um, and, I, and I'm grateful for that. I think my life would have been a little bit less rich had I been more, had I, had I stuck to a more of a plan, I, I think it would have been a little bit less rich. Now that that's me personally. Um, I think, I, I think the prob this probably happens for everyone. We all end up in places we had not expected. And I think that's some of the, that's part of the pleasure of life is, is, is to be surprised. Your method seems slightly different than my own. Is mm -hmm. are, where you're at in life? Are you self-actualized? Are you are you completely where you like being in where you are? Do you feel like you are where you you belong? Like like in the Mas, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. You know, when you said are you actualized, I, I, I immediately thought, have I reached spiritual nirvana? Um, <laughs> You know, I don't think anyone uh, is <laughs> achieves perfect self-actualization. I, maybe they do, but I, I, I doubt it. I'm that uh, one person think, so far. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, like, I'm not the Dalai Lama. Uh, uh, 
you know, I think I'm on a path. I think the path is an interesting one, and I, you know, and I'm I'm glad I'm on this path and not some other path. So I don't know if that answers the question. But I, you know, am I happy doing what am I do, what I'm doing? Do I think it's meaningful? Um, do I think it's helping other people? Do I think you know our our intents are towards betterment? Yeah, all of the above. And I and the, you know not everyone can say that in their job. Um, and I'm really grateful for it. Is is what you do? I mean, I mean like you've asked me like silly, uh, maybe weird questions, but is it a job or a vocation? What you what you're doing? Well, it. I have no a job or an avocation or a job or a vocation. Vocation with a V, I think. <laughs> you know, this started as a hobby for me. So, you know, when we built the first gen space, I did it out when I was not working. It was my, it was the thing I did on nights and weekends. Um, and it's only in the last couple of years where this became what I do from, you know, 9 a.m. till 6 p.m. or whatever. Uh, actually, obviously. Yes, I do it from 9 a.m. to 6 p.m., but at, also into weekends and nights and whatever. Um, but, you know, this is this is my career, if, if that's what you mean. Um, and, I, you know, but it, but it started as a hobby. Um, and it started as a curiosity, uh, you know, and it started as something that I was writing about. Uh, so... Yeah, I don't have the I don't have the answer to you uh, for you, but I do know that you know this is this is what I do with you know this is my career, yeah. and I you know and I don't want to uh, I don't want to be doing something else. Mm-hmm. Well, the way I think of it, and I think I think you answered it well, is that like j- from job to vocation, I see it as a sliding scale between like your motivation for doing it, like. Is it if it's purely financial, then it's more towards job. If it's more meaning and value based on what your intrinsic values are, then it's more vocation. And for what you've told mm-hmm. me, you seem to be more on the vocation side. So I, I like career development. So I feel like, so I don't know. Maybe I mean, you paid a lot. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I would say this is somewhere between a, a mission and. Um, and as you define it, a vocation. For people who are looking to, you know, have a, a good balance like that, you know, taking care of the bills so they're not starving or, or what have you, living healthily, and finding something that is more towards their vocation or career pro- prospects, what type of things should they be considering? Like from, like looking back on your life, and you could like see like a younger version of yourself, or like someone who's going to be going through similar things. Like, what questions would you have them think about to? find what's the unique voice in themselves and balance it between financial reward and meaning and value that you put out to the community. Um, if there is no good answer, you can just say pass. Uh, you know, honestly, most of my career I've spent, spent searching, um, you know, uh, in the early days as a journalist, I was searching for, stories and things to write about that excited me and interested me. Um, and then in this position, you know, um, I've been searching for ways to strengthen and sustain our community. Um, I've had the real privilege to interact with people who are artists and designers who are looking at new ways in which this technology might be able to be used. Maybe the best advice for you is, you know, find people who are interesting to you, who interest you, and listen to them and, and hear what excites them about what they do. Um, I think it's always going to be a search. And, and, and that's just, <laughs> that might just be the, 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 the condition of being a human. Which I think that's kind of like, in my opinion, I think that's one of the things that's kind of like sticking with us. Like, today because we kind of have the world map we don't have manifest destiny anymore and yet we're explorers so i think like everyone has like that hunger inside them to explore something but or like to essentially be a scientist if they like you just still on what it means to be an explorer but um i'm sorry my last question what i'll, I'll leave on a fun one what type of nerd are you like it, when you're not at work when you're not you know doing all this stuff like what do you do for fun do you like watch star trek i mean do you read books 
And if you do read books, recommendations, please. I like to read a lot. But uh, <laughs> what type of nerd are you? Oh, gosh. Um, I just took a, a nighttime class on da Donna Haraway, who wrote, who's a philosopher of science, who wrote a book called, or wrote an essay called The Cyborg Manifesto. Um, so I, I like reading um, literature from science and technology studies. Um, so that. Um, I've been reading some Ursula Le Guin recently. She, there's a new book out of some of, I guess she was blogging, and there's sort of selections from her blog posts, which are, some of them are, are sad, and some of them are silly, and some of them are just a lot of fun. And Ursula Le Guin is, is just wonderful. If you haven't read Left Hand of Darkness, I would turn the podcast off and start listening to it now, uh, or start reading it now. Is it the um, one? Uh, no, it's um, it's about a, a sort of a planet where there is no gender, and and it's a it's it's the description of the peoples on this planet and and what it is like to be them. It's wonderful. So you know, occasionally, if if I've really had a bad day, like the worst day, uh, I'll flip on uh, some Star Trek: The Next Generation on Netflix. I, you know, I watched that when I was 12 years old. It's still comforting. So, yeah, occasionally I'll do that. By the way, you know, there is no, uh, they don't do genetic engineering in Star Trek. It's been, it, it's been made illegal in whatever century they're in, which is an interesting detail to know. Yeah, um, they had the, the eugenic wars around this time. Like, in the next, like, 20 years, we just have the eugenic wars. Exactly. Yeah. So that's interesting. Looking forward to that. Um <laughs> We'll see. Yeah. <laughs> let's see how that goes. Um, let's see. Uh, in terms of reading, I just finished not too long ago uh, Jeff Vandermeer's book, um, Annihilation, which was turned into a movie um, with Natalie Portman, which is really good. He also has a, a book on writing science fiction called, I think, Wonder Book, which has uh, essays by all kinds of uh, science fiction favorites, including Ursula Le Guin. Uh, I think I haven't gotten to that chapter yet. Certainly Neil Gaiman. So that's really fun. I mean, 20 years late, I just read uh, Barack Obama's uh, autobiography, uh, Dreams with Dreams of My Father, which is fantastic. It was wow, well, wow. Have you uh, read um, to, to interject real quick? Have you read Benjamin Franklin's mm -hmm. autobiography or the books on Benjamin Franklin by chance? You know, I was supposed to read it in college, and I did not read it. I was going to ask if it compares to that, because I have kind of a, I have like a rule where I try not to read anything written by someone who's still alive, because um, because like they're sometimes less than honest, or like they kind of like fabricate the stories a little bit. But your mm -hmm. response makes it seem like maybe it's not the case with his book. Like it makes it sound like it's actually quite meaning, like a, a content rich. So so what was wonderful about Dreams of, of My Father is that it was written by o Barack Obama when he was in 1995. Uh, so he he wasn't he wasn't famous yet. I don't, I don't even think he, I think he was like a state politician as opposed state level politician as opposed to someone working in the federal government. And it's really about his search for identity, being um, having a father from Kenya and and a, and a mom who. Uh, whose parents were from, I think, Kansas or Kentucky. And it's about his search for identity. And it's incredibly, feels incredibly honest, and incredibly compelling. Um, and I would recommend it to anyone. Not, you know, and it's just, it, it's sort of amazing that someone of, it's amazing that, that the character in that book became president. It's, it's just, it's spectacular. Well, anyone can do it. <laughs> that's whenever someone says something negative about the current political system i i see it as an affirmation that anyone can do it you know like but um well, well you know abraham lincoln was completely self-taught completely he he yeah. taught himself everything well, uh, that guy was gifted when he, yeah sorry yeah so Oh, and that was my reading. You know, before I was reading all of this, I was reading another uh, a, a biography of Lincoln, which was just amazing. Uh, yeah. Which was called Team of Rivals. Yeah. yeah, I read that one. It's really good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was like, finally, something I read. <laughs> More of that. <laughs> uh, 
Um, and if you haven't read War and Peace, <laughs> you should pick that one up too. That is, I would, that is one of the, that is easily the best piece of literature that I know of. It's on my, it's on my bottom of my list. It's like, if I was stuck on an island and I had nothing better to do, I'd read, no offense, but like, it just, I read like the first chapter and there's like so many Alexanders, I think. Or I just, I don't know. I was like eight when I started reading it, so I probably should try it again. But, um, I promise you, if you get, if you get through page, uh, let's say 20, you, you will finish that book and you will be grateful that you finished it. It is, it is amazing. Right. Absolutely amazing. And that was Dan Grushkin of Gene Space, Gen Space. I suck at names. If you want to get in contact, check the show notes. You got LinkedIn's, you got websites, you got all those things. Anyone who is kind of looking or has a project that's kind of burning a hole through their head, trying to get out, should contact Gen Space or Dan and, and see if they can help out. They are in the New York region, but even if you're not in that area, you know, send an email. It's better than leaving it burning in your head, right? So let's get into this. Other than that, I want to inform people before we go that there is a new way to show support for the podcast and to keep it advertisement free from now until forever, which is called Patreon. If you go to Patreon and look for Learning with Lowell, you'll see this podcast. Don't forget to subscribe and leave a review. We can be found on Twitter at Lowell This Year, Facebook, and on the website, learningwithlowell.com. Also sign up for the newsletter where you can hear amazing content every Monday, new episodes every Tuesday, and new blog posts around every Thursday. Remember to share and tell your friends. Please and thank you.